The Ludendorff Bridge at Remagen had not been blown because the Germans were supposed to use it to come back into France after the negotiated separate peace. But the French First Army cut off the German retreat into Switzerland through the Schwabian highlands, spoiling what was left of the British plan. After Ike took the Ninth Army away from Monte on the 4th of April and gave it back to Bradley, the Ninth Army reached the Elba on the 11th of April near Magdeburg and crossed the river while Monte was still 60 miles away and the Russians had still not attacked the Silo Heights, so the Americans and the Russians were roughly equidistant from Berlin. The day before, Patton had been warned on the 10th of April that some commandos were planning to sneak in and kill him, so he started carrying his carbine to bed with him, and on the 12th of April, the day FDR died, Ike and Bradley and Patton went to see a salt mine at Merkers outside Frankfurt, and Patton looked at the elevator cable and said, if that clothesline should part, promotions in the U.S. Army would be considerably stimulated. In addition to 100 million in gold bullion, the MPs found 3 billion Reichsmarks. Another 2 million in American greenbacks, together with Lesser's lesser quantities of British, Norwegian, and French currency had been stacked in those dry salt chambers 2,100 feet below the ground. Bradley, page 527. Then they went to see the concentration camp at Ordruf that Patton had overrun several days before, and they visited the one million square foot underground Nordhausen rocket factory outside Frankfurt where the Germans had been building the new V-2 rockets capable of obliterating several square miles per each rocket. And the first V-2 rocket had been tested in January right before FDR had called the meeting at Yalta and the Germans had been making 400 of them each month before abandoning the factory only one week before the Americans marched in. When Edward P. Murrow arrived in Buchenwald with Patton's Third Army on the 11th of April, he walked around the camp pressing hundreds of dollar bills into the hands of walking skeletons, money won in a poker game the night before, and on the 15th of April, Patton took the townsfolk on a tour of the Bulkenwald camp, and that same day Ed Murrow broadcast the story from London to his CBS listeners. The news of FDR's death almost overwhelmed the news about the camps, but not quite, and Churchill's order that camp atrocity stories be censored as hindering the war effort no longer mattered as the censors seemed to have lost their power and the truth came out about the work camps and the slave labor that had been fueling Hitler's war. The reason that the bridge at Remagen had been so important was that supplies for the war were delivered primarily by railway, while prisoners were taken to the work camps on the return trip, and Remagen was a double-track rail line. On the 15th of April, the BBC continued to refuse any broadcast of news about the discovery of Berg and Belson, but the Americans were getting out their own news, so the British were forced to report it. But they blamed the condition of the camps on bombed-out supply lines, although the prisoners were telling a different story. The diarist Anne Frank had died three weeks earlier in Bergen-Belsen that was 30 miles north of the capital of Hanover, and from the beginning of the war, the British news media had left a paper trail that was difficult to deny. Berlin, March 8, 1936. Hitler has got away with it! Exclamation point. France is not marching! I learned today on absolute authority that the German troops which marched into the demilitarized zone of the Rhineland yesterday had strict orders to beat a hasty retreat if the French army opposed them in any way. They were not prepared or equipped to fight a regular army. I called our London office to see what the British are going to do. They laughed and read me a few extracts from the Sunday press. 
Garvin's Sunday Observer and Rothmere's Sunday Dispatch are delighted at Hitler's move. The British are now busy restraining the French! Exclamation point. The Human Adventure, Readings in World History by Sidney Eisen and Maurice Filler, Volume 2, Harcourt Brace and World, Inc., 1964, page 173 and 4, from William L. Shirer's Berlin Diary, page 55 and 8. When the Germans marched into the Rhineland in 1936, things had not been going well for Germany as the country... Oh, things had been going well for Germany as the country was being purged of Jew communists, not only because jobs were opening up, but because there were plenty of newly vacant homes selling at reasonable prices. Germans, now working in better jobs, eagerly rooted out more Jew communists as their absence made even more employment positions available. And if National Socialism failed and the Jews came back, these new jobs would be taken away. On Bastille Day on the 14th of July in 1935, Germany had become a one-party state with all other political parties banned, and that had allowed swift passage of the Nuremberg Laws, giving the processing centers the power to revoke citizenship so the Gestapo could seize anyone's assets without trial, and at the same time, forced sterilizations began. The camps were all built as places where offenders could do useful labor for helping Germany, and they put up big signs at the entrances that said, Work makes free, in order to welcome the new people. Inmates were told that contributing to Germany would be rewarded, and the processing centers were operating in every district with the utmost German efficiency. It was not seen as objectionable or unfair that guilt was being decided on the streets by the police because they were supported by the majority of citizens, and it was believed that these cases would be settled in the camps when the offenders arrived from the processing centers. The camps used the same large barracks well known throughout Germany as workers' warehouses that the Kaiser had set up as a joint venture between the government and private businesses, places where transient or displaced pers where a transient or displaced person could get regular meals and a clean bed, and everyone knew that Hitler himself had lived in one of these work hostels. The unemployed the unemployed received what they needed to find work. And these working man shelters had a barber and a tailor and a doctor in residence. And these shelters with the wooden barracks had been around for decades. So it was assumed that the exact same protocol was being implemented in the camps now blossoming under National Socialism, where the needy were being concentrated or assembled and then gifted with jobs and real work. Homelessness had not been a problem in Germany since the Kaiser started these workhouses called Herbergen, and they even sold beer and cigars there at a reduced price to the residents. And by the turn of the century, there had been thousands of these working man barracks all across Germany. So Hitler simply expanded on an old idea, and what had worked for thousands would now work for millions. The camps were designed to fill the need for making community service work po possible, and also to provide for the needy or the dispossessed, and these work centers run by the government in industrial centers were now simply extended to include the administration of justice, and the whole system was considered a good economical program for success. After 1936, the production of uniforms and war materials being made in the camps turned the arrangement into a thriving enterprise, and as the camps boomed, processing centers funneled ever more workers into the labor camps because too many of them had been dying in typhoid epidemics. The scythe of disease decimating the concentrations of prison workers was not addressed because the big money maker was in the initial arrest of prisoners, and Jews especially were, after all, dispensable. And as prisoners died, the demand for more workers called out for more arrests. 
Himmler had been appointed Germany's chief of police on April Fool's Day in 1933 and had called for a boycott of all Jewish businesses, but the boycott didn't work because Germans continued to do business with Jews, and so the Nazis needed to step up the brainwash propaganda against Jews using the newspapers and radio broadcasts and the movie industry. In less than three years of listening to these smears against the chosen people spewed forth from the broadcast media, claiming to be in sync with the authority of the government, there were few of the master race who did not believe the propaganda who did not believe the propaganda to be true, and it came to pass that many good Germans began to think that the best thing that could happen for the Jews was for them all to become Christians. When too many Jews refused this kind offer, there would be hell to pay. And while some Jews had blended in with the Germans in an attempt to ameliorate Jew hatred, others kept to themselves in their own enclaves for self-protection from the Gentiles and their renewed campaign to blame Jews for having killed Christ. There were two kinds of Jews. Those who thought a Jewish homeland in Palestine was a good idea, and those who thought there should be no Jewish state at all until the Messiah returned to set up his Jewish state. The no-state Jews believed it was their religious duty to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah by establishing governments run by Jews prepared to receive him. And when Messiah appeared, the worldwide Jewish government would remain in place with the faithful continuing to serve in their positions of authority during the ensuing Messianic age. And to these Jews, anyone who wanted to migrate to Palestine was an absolute traitor to Judaism. The majority of Jews trusted God to take care of them, or to care for them. The majority of Jews trusted God to care for them and did not believe in fighting back against the Nazis, holding that the definition of a good Jew was to be pleasant and accommodating, and on many occasions in the concentration camps, escape plans from within the ranks of Jewry were intentionally thwarted by other incarcerated Jews claiming to have a superior knowledge of the religion and the vast majority, whether religious or not, maintained that Jews should not be soldiers, but must leave military matters in the hands of the Gentiles. To disprove the point, the first German officer killed in the Great War had been Jewish, and beyond that the contradictions about God's people had just kept coming, as Jews had learned to run from raging mobs so they were called cowards and they learned to do business with crippling restrictions, and so they were called sneaky. And they were only allowed to deal with money matters, so they were called greedy. And they were not allowed into Christian organizations, and so they were called secretive. And the trains full of people on their way to the camps were relatively quiet, because they thought that things would go better for them if they didn't make trouble. And their ready compliance convinced everyone that the dirty Jew knew that they finally had it coming. The Great War had scattered people around, when usually they'd gone no farther than a dozen miles from their own village. And when strangers came along, they usually brought disease with them, so strangers were feared and hated. Jews traveled more easily from foreign lands because of their common language, and in most other countries, Jews were ostracized, but in German cities they had been welcomed. Many Jews had become traveling salesmen after being chased out during pogroms and other witch hunts, and for centuries their principal product had been opium brought up from the Golden Crescent in the Holy Land. If pain was the disease and opium was the cure, and no medical treatment alleviated suffering as much as opium, and no medicine alleviated opium dependence, except more opium. The Jewish peddlers who brought this miraculous relief to isolated German villages had become both a blessing and a curse. The witch-burning had not been done by a mob of maddened peasants, but by the educated magistrate, 
and the university in Vienna would not admit their first Jew until 1787, and no Jew was admitted into Parliament in England until 1855. In Austria, Jews had been banned from being lawyers or doctors until 1862, and because Jews were not allowed into schools, they created their own Hebrew schools, and that made it easier to flee from persecution because at least where they went, they were able to speak the same language with their new countrymen. Jews were thought to be overly ambitious to make up for past persecutions, and Jews were not welcomed in the country, so they lived in the cities. And after the Great War, Berlin in the 20s and early 30s was even worse than the scenes in the movie Cabaret. So Jews were accused of bringing immorality into Germany and stories about the destructive and depraved Jews terrified the German peasants. The lives of the common country folk hadn't changed for centuries, and superstition was rampant with their tales of haunted forests and witches' spells, and disease was still thought to be caused by demon possession. So many villages still burned at least one witch every year just to be safe. Most German villages were sleepy and backward, so when a stranger came through they definitely stood out, and the only Jews these people had ever known were the traveling peddlers bringing opium that allowed their women to bring child to bear children without pain, and to the deeply religious this was seen as going against God's will. German country folk did not want government intruding on their lives, and rarely took advantage of the social wel welfare programs started by the Kaiser that were used primarily by people in the cities. The sick and the old could always find something useful to do on the farm, or at least be out of the way. So unemployment was not a problem in German farming villages, and few of them even noticed the Nazi storm blowing through Germany. Jew bashing was nothing new a leftover from centuries of religious warfare. And there had been armies marching through their villages longer than that, first one side devastating the countryside, and then the other marching through, leaving death and destruction in their wake. And Hitler's war was just one more wave of the same. The villagers would gather in the local tavern to drink beer and sing songs, for the most part ignoring Hitler and his speeches. And these German country people saw the Nazis as just more city folk making trouble. When people from the city began paying higher prices for the food grown in the village, the country folk in Germany started to notice, and more and more city people were coming out to the farms wanting to buy until the villagers started running low themselves. And the villagers grew the same amount of corn and beets and rutabagas and cabbages and fed the same amount of pigs every year. So the disruption caused by the Nazi socialism had gotten their attention. The villagers' livestock were more like family than animals, and the country Germans would go out to the fields every day to cut fresh grass for their animals, bringing the pasture to the cow and this way the animals would not trample the precious grass with grazing. The horses and cows were kept in the living room during the winter, or in a room adjoining the living quarters, and this helped to heat the house, and they were more than dismayed when the Nazis would come after their livestock in pursuit of Hitler's war. New farming machines mass-producing food had lowered prices for their city-bound products before the war, and German farmers had blamed the city folk for being unwilling to pay the actual cost, and Hitler had seen that as a failure of morality, so he had no sympathy when it came time for requisitioning their horses and livestock. At least Hitler could count on the country folk not to shelter Jews, and as hard as the war would be on Jews, it was worse for the horses. Hitler blamed Judeo-Christianity for bringing down the Roman Empire, and in the 30s everyone wanted to be Roman, with Mussolini the foremost virile example, and Rome was a close second.
Before Jews had spread their version of spirituality into the Nordic realms, the German forest peoples had a pre-Christian religion all their own, and the ancient Germans thought illegitimate children were just as worthy as those born within marriage, which explained why it was considered normal for Hitler's mother to have been born illegitimate, since one-third of German children were. The leader of the SA was flamboyantly gay, and thus a real man's man, and Ernst Julius Gunther Rühm had serious scars on his face from being wounded in the Great War. Speaking his name sounded like the revving of a motorcycle engine, and right after the Great War, Rühm founded the Storm Battalion and started the Reichskriegsflagge, or the Imperial Flag Club, that carried guns as well as flags, and they joined the Imperial Flag Combat League, and these both joined the stormtroopers who had fought in the Great War. The early SA had a lot to do with galloping horses in martial maneuvers with flags flying, and it was more than an impressive spectacle because they were deadly serious about avenging the fatherland over the politicians who had stabbed Germany in the back. Hrum wasn't particularly interested in politics, but just wanted to have a little army of his own, and Hrum had been the best fundraiser for the Nazis, and had always been able to come up with rich male friends willing to donate, and he was also a master at procuring weapons. Hrum turned the stormtroopers into his own private club, and when Hitler challenged him, Rühm sent a resignation letter to all the newspapers asking Hitler, quote, not to deprive him of his personal friendship, close quote, that had clear romantic undertones. So Hitler gave him an unmistakable answer on the 30th of June in 1934 that would be called the Night of Long Knives, and it was a warning to the entire German nation that, quote, homosexuality, debauchery, drunkenness, and high living, close quote, would no longer be tolerated in Germany's government. The message was received loud and clear, and few protested the night of long knives because being gay was something known to be encouraged by Jews. And a large part of the accusation against the Jews was that they wanted to turn everyone into sexual degenerates. Henry Ford had a factory in Germany and wanted to enlighten the world with his Dearborn Independent newspaper. And Ford said, Jews had started the Great War, Bolshevism, Darwinism, Marxism, Nietzsche, short skirts, and lipstick. They were behind Wall Street and the international bankers and white slave traffic and the movies and the Supreme Court and ragtime and the illegal liquor business. The big money by John Dos Passos, New York, Washington Square Press, Inc., Houghton Mifflin Company, 1930, 1961, page 55, part of the USA Trilogy, which includes the 42nd Parallel and 1919. And so we entered the Aryan Café, Berlin's latest attraction. We passed a banquet hall with Prussian blue draperies and garishly decorated walls and all sorts of erotic and sodomic pictures in this strange seraglio, seraglio of the Friedrich, Friedrichstrasse, which in New York would be called the Times Square District, Sinful Cities of the Western World by Hendrik de Lu, New York Citadel Press, 1934-1945, page 236. For dearth of being involved in the regular course of German life, Jews in German cities had turned to the entertainment industry, and they seemed to purposefully be working at sticking a thumb in the eye of the accepted culture of Christian morality. Those Jews who organized nightlife and turned all normal morals upside down, the three faces of fascism by Ernst Nolte, London, Wiedenfeld and Nicholson, 1965, page 510, from Marx das Kapital, volume 3, part 1, Hamburg, 1904, page 324 following. Dr. Ruth 
would come to America after the war to talk about Jewish sex on the radio, and she'd been taught the Talmud by her father before he was killed by Nazis. And Jewish children like Dr. Ruth had been sent for safekeeping to Switzerland, where they were treated with excessive discipline and trained to be servants. And when Dr. Ruth's parents didn't show up after six months, the Swiss women would say, What kind of parents do you have? They should have been here by now. The Swiss allowed 21,000 Jews to stay in Switzerland and turned more than that back towards Germany. And there were four million Swiss who spoke German and accepted German gold and hosted Nazis as their best customers, and the Swiss would rent out rooms for the temporary storage of Jewish children at a reasonably stiff price. The king of Bulgaria sent his Jews out to live in the countryside, which got him assassinated. And in Hungary, one-third of all the stores and factories had been owned and managed by Jews. And Raoul Wallenberg had been born in Sweden and would help Hungarian and Balkan Jews escape, but was betrayed to the Russians by a spy, as a spy by unknown secret agents. Wallenberg had been sent to school at the University of Michigan where he studied architecture, and when he went back to Sweden, Wallenberg won an award for designing a public bathhouse, and while his grandmother was one-quarter Jewish, it was not enough to get on a death list in Hungary, where he had become the part owner of a factory owned by a Hungarian Jew. Wallenberg had learned to be brave by hitchhiking when he was in college, and had once been robbed at gunpoint in 1934. And he said that hitchhiking had taught him how to be diplomatic. At three in the morning, the synagogue's radio fell silent. A Jew rushed in from the street and shouted that, that the Arrow Cross had just captured the broadcasting center. Minutes later, the radio started playing German marches. The friendly Hungarian captain became drunk for Laszlo Ernster, for the Jews of Budapest, and for Raoul Wallenberg, the real hell was about to begin. Lost Hero, the Mystery of Raoul Wallenberg by Frederick E. Werbel and Thurston Clark, New York, New American Library, McGraw-Hill, Inc., 1982-1985, page 56. In Hungary they came up with a flag with the arrow cross. Most were old men, the war-wounded, and illiterate teenage boys from Budapest's slums. Leaders listed each new recruit's name in a register and gave each an armband and a loaded automatic rifle. The armband was a license to steal from the Jews, the rifle a means of fulfilling Salazi's promise to, quote, decisively solve Germany's Jewish problem, close quote, Lost Hero, The Mystery of Raoul Wallenberg, page 60. There were more than a million Jews in Hungary, and one out of four students at the university were Jewish, and one-third of the Jews deported to the extermination factories with the help of the Arrow Cross had come from other parts of Europe and had fled to safety in Hungary. A book called The Cry in the Covenant described the difference between Austria and Hungary, the story of a young Hungarian man who'd come to Budapest to be a doctor, and he was poor and had scraped by while the Austrians were cosmopolitan and wealthy. When people came to the hospital, the rich died faster than the poor because they received more medical attention, and the Austrian doctors had refused to wash their hands for fear of offending the patients, insisting that the poor were simply more hardy, fit mostly for soldiering. The snobby Austrians didn't want sick people to think the doctors were squeamish about touching them if seen washing their hands, and the young Hungarian doctor named Simmelweis finally worked his way up to being able to get the doctors and nurses to wash their hands, and Simmelweis became a hero because people stopped dying in the Budapest hospitals. Wallenberg worked to save Jews in Hungary beginning in July of 1944, 
and he handed out Swedish passports until the Russians surrounded Budapest the day after the Americans liberated Bastogne. And on the 17th of January, the Russians demanded that Wallenberg come to Debrecen to answer questions about what Himmler was cooking up with the Swedes. Originally, the government of Sweden had wanted to send Count Bernadotte, the Red Cross Swedish Boy Scout master, to negotiate for the safety of the Hungarian Jews. And Bernadotte had been working with Himmler and his Sonderzug, 44, while the Hungarian Nazis were loyal to Hitler and had refused to let Bernadotte into the country, so Wallenberg had been given the job. Himmler had been making deals with Bernadotte through Himmler's personal concentration camp at Ravensbrück. And when the Battle of the Bulge failed and Patton relieved Bastogne, Himmler was freed from his command post in the Sondersuk 44 train, sitting across from where Patton had been before the Bulge. Rumors of negotiations for a separate peace were swirling, with Himmler's name usually mentioned, and to deflect from his own complicity in making deals with Hungary when the Russians showed up on the outskirts of Budapest, Bernadotte gave up Wallenberg to Himmler, and Himmler told the British, and the British told Kim Philby, and Philby told the Russians, who wanted to interview Wallenberg about Himmler's activities. Wallenberg left Budapest to report to the Russian commander who had suggested that he come immediately, and Wallenberg drove away from Budapest on the 17th of January, the same day Himmler ordered the evacuation of Auschwitz, and Wallenberg soon vanished without a trace. On the 8th of March, the Soviets in Hungary broadcast over the radio that Wallenberg had been murdered by the Gestapo with the help of the Arrow Cross while driving to Debrecen, and the Russians said that his driver had also been killed, and Debrecen was the old capital city of Hungary, 120 miles to the east of Budapest and Debrecen had been occupied by the Russians since October of 1944. There had been a summons for Wallenberg issued from the top Soviet command to the commander at Debrecen on the day Wallenberg drove away, so any spy would have known where he was going and why, since Himmler's dealings with the Swedes was no secret. Historians have speculated that it was probably a communist Hungarian Jew named Vilmos Berm who had ratted out Wallenberg, but Vilmos would have been just a small player trying to save his own skin, while Moscow wanted to talk to Wallenberg about what Himmler was up to because Kim Philby had been keeping Stalin well in informed about the British attempts at a separate peace with Germany. Many Jews had survived in Hungary by pretending they were Christians, and for the sake of survival had been complicit in turning in their fellow Jews, people with names like Farkas. And when the Russians showed up to put an end to the business of shipping Jews to Germany, the next step had been to rat out the Jew traffickers to the Russians. The hell of it was that many of the turned-in Hungarian Jews deported to Germany had been rescued and sent to Palestine instead, where there was a real danger that those Jews in Palestine could point out their betrayers some day, and that drove the guilty to hope for the annihilation of the State of Israel, if not to actively contribute to its destruction. The Swedes had been collecting Jews who had information about who had been smuggled into Palestine. And Himmler would be in Berlin for Hitler's birthday, and Hitler was an Austrian the same as Adolf Eichmann. And Simon Wiesenthal, Wiesenthal said that there was a higher percentage of Nazis in Austria than in Germany, and that Austrians killed half of all the murdered Jews. Austria had been eager to join the Reich because they'd been a large empire before the Great War, after which they'd been split into Poland, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Romania, Czechoslovakia, and part of Italy. 
And Eichmann had grown up in the same small town in Austria as Hitler, and he'd ridden a red motorcycle into Vienna every day while he was working for the vacuum oil company. Eichmann had been a member of the Young Men's Christian Association before he joined the von der Vogel, and he'd been a member of the Jungfront Kampf fever bond. Eichmann had had some Jewish relatives, and as a boy he'd been called the Little Jew because he was darker than the other children, and when he was promoted to be the head of the transportation department, responsible for shipping Jew-communist criminals to camps in Poland, Eichmann read books about Jews written by Jews to inform his work in his new job. Eichmann liked the idea of a homeland for Jews in Palestine, and he admired the Zionists who invited him to Palestine in 1937, and Eichmann climbed Mount Carmel with some Jewish leaders before the British kicked him out. Eichmann wanted to bring all the Jews to Palestine, where he could be their protector, and he hoped to create a Jewish homeland in Poland first, and then later move them to Palestine, because trains could carry them efficiently by the hundreds of thousands, and Eichmann would complain at his trial that his fellow Nazis had sabotaged his work by stealing from the Jews and mistreating them. Hitler had also wanted to create a homeland for Jews, and was encouraging them to leave Germany to make a state of their own, so they would no longer be persecuted for being outsiders. But nobody wanted them anywhere near their own borders, and since the Great War, the British had been holding the Holy Land hostage. Hitler tried to make a deal with the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem to allow German Jews to resettle there and Hitler had been making some headway when the British shut it down, and the newspapers would not make a case for a homeland in Jerusalem for Jews, and were turning a blind eye in 1935 to what was happening to them in Germany. No newspaper stories would be printed about the camps, no matter how many desperate people told them about it and all the whistleblowers were met with silence and with lame excuses such as that they didn't want to make Hitler any more angry with Jews than he already was. In Prague we met a spokesman for Slovakian Jewry. He testified briefly, 60% of the Jews of Slovakia, about 16,000 of 20,000 persons, wished to leave the country as soon as possible. Of these, 90% were determined to go to Palestine. Most had been Zionists of long standing. What had happened in the last decade had only confirmed them in their conviction that Jewish quote-unquote homelessness was responsible in great part for the Jewish tragedy. You must understand that many here are disillusioned with the democracies, he said. I can tell you that in 1942, we here in Slovakia were the first to notify London about what was taking place in Auschwitz, but London did not wish to believe that Jews were being deported to Auschwitz and, Auschwitz and burned to death. When the Hungarians continued to deport Jews there, we sent a plea to London. We sent along a map showing the railroad on which the trains took Jews to Auschwitz and all other necessary information and begged the British military authorities to bomb those railroads, railroads but it was decided not to bomb them because the military situation didn't warrant it. Behind the Silken Curtain, a personal account of Anglo-American diplomacy in Palestine and the Middle East, by Bartley C. Crum, New York, Simon and Schuster, 1947, page 118 and 19. The explanation given to the Americans was that, quote, British policy was based on the protection of British interests against Russia, and explaining that it should be in our interests to fall in with that policy, close quote, behind the silken curtain, page 8. The biggest tragedy of the Holocaust was that very little of what was going on inside the Reich made it into the newspapers. And in the face of such silence, 
Hitler started collecting specimens and exhibits for a Jewish museum, but it was never open because anyone who saw the collection came back with respect and admiration for Jews, which was a problem because the Nazi policy was based on blaming and looting the Jews, while ordinary miscreants had little in the way of material wealth worth seizing. At first, each Jewish family was required to send one person to the camps to help in the rebuilding of Germany, and the family was told that their wages would be sent back home, but the money usually did not arrive, because the Germans running the camps were confiscating it simply because it was so easy. Instead, another notice would be sent requesting an additional family member until in a few years the entire family had to report for work duty. Eichmann was working closely with Jewish organizers to select young people incarcerated in the camps and give them the opportunity to go to Palestine to join Jewish kibbutzes and Eichmann helped get them on trains out of Germany and transport them safely into training camps in Yugoslavia where they could learn farming skills before traveling to the Holy Land to join the Zionists. And Hannah Arendt said that Eichmann even kicked some nuns out of their convent in order to give these Jews a temporary home. Trains going through Switzerland had locked cars with bars on the windows and people could be heard inside crying for water when they stopped at a station, and the good Swiss citizens would keep their distance and point at the cars, saying, There go more criminals. Passenger trains would pull a few extra cars attached to the rear with signs that said, Danger, criminals. And the regular passengers were proud that modern government was so able to efficiently deal with these lawbreakers so honest citizens could be kept safe. As the concentration camps filled up, townspeople would point to them with pride, happy that the government was finally doing something about crime and corruption. Eichmann wanted to keep Jews honest and made sure they paid their own way to Auschwitz and the Nazis kept meticulous records, not simply because they thought what they were doing was correct and proper, but because they thought they were being scientific, and keeping accurate records would help with the overall effort. Eichmann made charts with different colors, so his timetables for the trains would be clear to the railway workers, and as the confusion continued, Eichmann insisted that all his commands be written down, but even written orders were often ignored, and that's why so many trains had been left on side tracks, waiting for clearance while the people inside were dying. Hitler was welcomed into Austria in 1938 and began seize, seizing Jewish assets and Hitler went to Czechoslovakia in March of 1939, where the three Axis powers signed Czechoslovakia's surrender treaty. And Hitler had come on his private Sondersuk train and stayed in a bohemian castle, and they sent someone into town to get cold cuts and beer, and Czechoslovakia was important, because that's where there were uranium mines. At first it, se it had seemed that the Jew bashing was just a ploy to get people to vote for the Nazis, and they thought it was a political trick and that the Jew bashing would stop after the elections. England, France, and Russia had persecute persecuted Jews for centuries, and they'd been excluded from owning land or working in the government, so the world of business had been the Jews' only option for survival, and so it had become a reality that, quote, the Jews had all the good jobs, and most of the doctors and lawyers were Jews, and, quote, the Jews owned most of the stores, and when reminded that 12,000 Jews had died in the German army during the Great War at a 12% casualty rate, the Nazis would say that other Germans died at 16%. 
It reminds me of the Japanese mission that went to Berlin to sign the Axis Pact in the late 1930s. The Japanese were enormously impressed with the success Hitler was having with this quote unquote gimmick. And when they left for home, one Japanese was heard to sigh, heard to sigh, ah, how I wish we had some Jews in Japan. Only in America by Harry Golden, New York Perma Books Signet Paperback, The World Publishing, 1944, 1958, page 204. It had taken only a year for Nazis to put new people into the offices held by the Weimar government, which was pretty fast for government work, and the problem of who was or was not a Jew became a priority. He admits that in many cases a Teuton or Aryan cannot easily be recognized, and it is sometimes necessary to use intuition or, quote, spiritual divination, close quote. Chamberlain confesses that there are many Jews who are not recognizable as such and who would usually be mistaken for Germans, but even in their case it often happens that when one of them enters a room, a German child, usually a girl, will unaccountably begin to cry. Race Differences by Otto Kleinberg, New York, Harper and Brothers Publishers, 1935, page 3-5. The weird thing was that Jews weren't even a race, but with the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, the concept of race became a legal fact, and courts would order people to be sterilized, and they were sentenced for crimes against the state just because they were old or sick or because they didn't fit in or have a place to go. And with the Nuremberg Laws, Jews were not allowed to walk on certain streets, were not allowed to own cats or dogs, were not allowed to drive or go shopping or buy food or sit in the park or ride the bus or buy a newspaper, and they also had to turn in their bicycles. A curfew was imposed, so Jews could not go out after 8 o'clock at night, and their radios were taken away, so they missed H. G. Wells's broadcast of The War of the Worlds on Halloween in 1938. Seven days later, a young man in Paris named Greenspan shot Ernst vom Rath, who was the Nazi embassy secretary, and it took Rath two days to die, and the day vom Rath died was the 15th anniversary of the Beer Hall Putsch, and all hell broke out in Germany. Called the Night of Broken Glass, 75,000 shops were looted, and all the synagogues were burned, and 20,000 Jewish men were arrested and blamed for causing all the trouble and made to pay whopping fines. Jewish businesses and factory, factories were confiscated and given to the Nazis, and some like Warburg, who put his bank into the hands of a local German Aryan, would find them unwilling to return the businesses after the war. Jewish men arrested after the night of broken glass were put into Dachau and Buchenwald, and most were released after being able to prove they were able and willing to leave Germany. They didn't just break windows on the night of broken glass, they stole all the stuff in the stores. And the Nazis didn't call it stealing, they called it getting even with war profiteers. German Jews were not all arrested right away, but were put to good use as a bad example, publicly humiliated and made fun of, and this common enemy and the overt daily harassment of them united the Nazi party, and Jewish agitators and Jewish troublemakers were still allowed to print newspapers because the Nazis could use their writing as clear examples of treason against the state. The judges in Germany became responsible for enforcing political legislation, and instead of working with laws and legal procedure, they became law enforcers, and the judges were required to punish acts against the state rather than judging cases objectively. A place was needed to put all the people under arrest for sabotaging National Socialism, separate from the work camps 
and the first jails were just warehouses and then barracks belonging to the army, and for inmates unable to pay their fines, groups of them were made to build more barracks and put up barbed wire fences around them. All over Germany, hundreds of compounds were built for the Nazis, and with a simple phone call, a carload of men with guns would come and take away your neighbors, and the gunmen were acting as officers of the court. As the camps filled up, it became a matter of choosing who would or would not be capable of performing productive labor that could benefit the fatherland, and being sent to the camps was not a death sentence at first, but an opportunity to work for the government. The camps and work distribution centers were everywhere, and all the Germans trusted the government to behave in everyone's best interests and being sentenced to the camps was a chance to work if money problems had been the only reason you'd been arrested. The camps were linked to sub-camps through the processing centers that were in every town and neighborhood. The camps were linked to sub-camps through the processing centers that were in, it, in every town and neighborhood, and Goebbels thought that half the Jews could be put to work, but that more than half would probably die if asked to do any real work, and being in the business of finance was not considered to be, quote-unquote, real work. The concentration camps were built like military boot camps to teach the value of hard work, and there were 165 labor camps and 22 prison camps in Germany by 1938. A country slightly bigger than the states of Washington and Oregon combined, and including Poland there were over 300 concentration camps, while the processing centers were merely transfer stations or hubs or temporary holding centers. Most thought the camps were a good idea, except for a few businessmen who worried about competing in the market with the forced labor. But the economy was under such stress after the cost of the Great War that the harm was overlooked, and most of the work being done by the camp prisoners was in preparation for the defense of Germany when the international bankers were expected to soon bring war against the fatherland. German businessmen accommodated the competition to their own industries, and the camp system actually became a new form of government, with the idea that having a camp in every neighborhood provided a convenient place where the law would preside, and if you had a problem with your neighbor, you could have him sent to the camp to be heard by the court, which was easier and cheaper than dealing with lawyers, or you could just threaten him with it. And this form of government was useful in collecting fines for the state and in settling old grudges. Up until 1936, there had been only 10 camps with 10,000 prisoners each. But that year, the economy had shifted towards war production and more incarcerated workers were needed to meet the labor demand. And in the next three years, they built ten times as many camps and even more processing centers for the political prisoners awaiting trial. And the best Jewish tailors were put to work in them making great uniforms for the German army. People were arrested and sent to processing centers for not wanting to work where the government sent them, or for complaining about the low wages, or for changing jobs to get a better work environment or to get a higher wage, and those with access to money could buy their way out of the camps, either by bribing the officials or by pa paying fines to the court. But most Jewish bank accounts were seized when they were arrested, and so being released became increasingly difficult, as they were unable to pay. The Germans basically set out to prove that Jews were incapable of work, and for the first three years, the Nazi government was making payroll off the bank accounts and home sales of the 10,000 people wearing striped clothing in prison camps. 
But when they'd used up all the assets from this first batch, the Nazis needed to find another source of funds to keep the government going, because the German payroll was monstrously large. The Strength Through Joy programs cost plenty of money, and Strength Through Joy was not just field trips, but also adult education classes and cruises on ocean liners. The bank accounts and property seized from Jews fueled Hitler's economic miracle, but when the available assets began to dwindle, Hitler needed to annex Austria and Czechoslovakia, and when those two were drained of Jewish money, he had to go into Poland, but the amount of money seized from Polish Jews turned out to be less than what was needed, despite the myth of the money-hoarding Jew, and the military was consuming much more of the budget than the Jews could cough up. By that time, systemic corruption had set in and was bleeding needed funds away from the Reich treasury into private pockets as the camps turned out to be a great money maker for the people running them. Although intended as work centers, the managers quickly realized that more money could be made in direct confiscation of assets than by forced labor, and when asked how things were going, the managers would report that the prisoners were dying of disease and more workers were needed to take their place. So in the first three years after Hitler's election, ten times as many camps needed to be built and a hundred times more people were put into them after giving up their bank account numbers and signing over the title deeds to their homes, told that these signatures were for safekeeping with the local bank. Hunting down Jews became the business of Germany, and the government payroll came from police searches and seizures, and people disappeared and didn't come back, and suddenly there would be nice new people moving into their old houses, while the new owners gave away the previous owner's furniture and clothes and kitchenware, and people soon forgot about the old owners and did not want to have to give back any of the goods should they some day return. The Germans imagined that the previous owners had done something terrible to have had their homes confiscated, and there were too few attempts to find anyone innocent in the camps because the seized bank accounts and assets would have had to be returned. Nazis saw to it that German that Jewish property was as widely distributed as possible so that the majority of Austrian people would have a stake in Nazism behind the silken curtain page 137 because there was a camp in every town and a processing center in every neighborhood everybody knew how they worked and what made the camps function so well was that most of the people in them were innocent, and everyone knew it was not necessary to commit a crime to get sent away, so people redoubled their efforts to get along with the state. By 1937, only one-third the number of people were in the camps as had been in them in 1933 because people had learned how to behave so as not to be sent away. Sabotage in the work camps was rare, as saboteurs were strictly policed by the other campers, many of whom were real cutthroat criminals, and the camps were seen as an efficient way to deal with offenders where they would be given some real justice. Actual Nazis who ended up in prisoned, imprisoned remained loyal to Hitler, believing their own incarceration to be just a mistake. The Nuremberg Laws of 1935 further spurred the growth of the concentration camps, and Jews in Germany were more mainstream than anywhere else in the world, and had become indistinguishable to the point where they had to volunteer their Jewishness. The conversation with a neighbor would go something like, Oh, isn't Hitler wonderful? He's saving us from the Jews. But Jews are good people. I'm half Jewish myself. 
The next week in the middle of the night, a gang of Nazis would break into that neighbor's home and send the family away on a truck, and the state would profit from the sale of the house, and the new neighbors would remark about how great it was to live in Germany where humble people like themselves could afford to buy such fine places to live. Jews had been allowed to leave Germany until more workers were needed to replace those being wiped out by typhus and typhoid in the labor camps. And they'd been allowed to leave with only what they could carry and given a free train ride if they had no luggage, but were required to pay if they wanted to take their suitcases with them. The people packed onto the trains were behaving as though they accepted that treatment as fairly do them. And the more they went along with the Nazi program, the more people wondered if they weren't inferior after all. In the beginning, those being deported were asked to write down a detailed list of their personal possessions and were given a ticket with a number marked down on the list. But this became too time-consuming, so they would simply be promised that their luggage had been put in another car on the train, and the passengers would watch as one of the train cars was stuffed full of everyone's suitcases before they climbed up in, into one of the passenger cars. The deportees tried to get as many people as possible into one car because they were told that the fare would increase if a quota wasn't met. And since they'd paid everything they had to get their ticket, people welcomed as many as could fit uncomfort uncomfortably into each train car. People welcomed as many as could fit uncomfortably into each train car. They believed they were bound for freedom and were being given a ride safely out of Germany and away from its awful Nuremberg laws. The people running the trains quickly discovered that detaining the passengers and stripping them of their belongings was a gold mine, and because asset seizures looked bad in public, more like common robbery, the Nazis would schedule train stops before reaching the German border where the occupants were told to disembark and were relieved of their personal possessions, and the warehouses at these stops, filling with secreted valuables, would be visited again on the return trip back into Germany. The Nuremberg racial laws turned Jews into offenders who could immediately be sent to the processing centers, and after being arrested and taken in large groups to a concert hall or an outdoor stadium, they were told to sign papers, giving up their bank accounts and real estate, or made to stand under guard for 24 hours if they refused. It was explained to them that they were being deported and that it was against the law to take more than 10 marks out of Germany, so their assets were being held in safe keeping until their deportation cases could be heard in the country to which they were going. Anyone who tried to transfer German money to another country had to pay between 50 and 95 percent in taxes and fees, and the exchange rates were terrible as well. So deportees were allowed to take all the stuff they could carry to sell for cash where they were going, since people did not want to leave without any money at all when they arrived in another country. They were taken to the train station and searched again at the border and given back ten marks, and the victims refrained from complaining lest the Nazis put a stop to Jews being allowed to leave at all. The Nazis didn't mind German goods walking onto the trains because it made those deported look like money-hungry criminals lugging satchels full of dinnerware and fancy clocks and jewelry. And when Jews filled out the forums describing their assets, they readily complied, believing it would prove ownership while the items carefully described were merely a list of what the Germans were seizing. When fleeing Germany became illegal due to the need for more workers in the camps, 
those caught deserting the fatherland were transported directly to the camps where they were found to be carrying money and jewels hidden in their clothing and luggage and having heard rumors of these riches taken from jews german policemen eagerly ripped through every german every jewish home searching for hidden money and treasure but usually came back empty-handed or with mere trinkets and hatred of jews grew over their being so devious in hiding their vast jewish jewish wealth there was a fatal contradiction in germany that guaranteed hitler would fail and that was simply the predominance of the nobility in the military because Historically, only members of the nobility were allowed to be officers, a tradition that was still in place right up until Hitler's election. This meant that many of his officers were born and bred into a tradition of polite discourse with the enemy, as evidenced by the flight of Rudolf Hess, and the notion that war was merely a gentleman's game was abhorrent to the Americans who had no sympathy for anything having to do with the nobility after having seen them in action in the Great War.